Welcome back to Lecture 1, Part B. It has long been our experience in this class that people are apprehensive about using the command line, at least at the start. I know a lot of people come into 217 straight out of 126, where the command line is left mysterious at best. 126 students learn a few shell commands, such as more, and about input and output redirection, but every time it's used, they can just copy it off the assignment checklist by rote. In this course, we're going to be using the shell command line interface a lot more. So the best thing you can do early in this course is to experiment. The earlier you play around and get up to speed using Linux, the less time you'll waste later on in the course trying to work through Linux confusion and inefficiency when you could be spending the time on topics more germane to the assignments themselves. So the rest of this part of lecture is going to be a walkthrough of some simple execution in the Linux command, uh, command line shell with a few more advanced things. Admittedly, this is going to be a whirlwind of information that's probably too much to take in all in one sitting, particularly if you're particularly new to Linux. But you might return to watch this again after you've gone to the first precept and gotten the precept handout giving you a, a different form of a whirlwind tour of all of the Linux commands you could ever imagine. Or even still, as you continue to experiment, you can come back and see wait, did I get everything? Do I now feel like this is less of a whirlwind and more just, yeah, I know this. I'll also give a little bit more time in this week's second lecture, so that that way if you follow along with it again, you'll get more time to practice, and also that will give me some chances to give you um, a few tips and tricks for idiomatic usage or more advanced features and configuring some niceties that make it a bit friendlier and more modern feeling place to work and develop. If you're already comfortable with Bash, great. I do encourage you to still watch the rest of this, but you can do it on super speed. But I know that anytime I sit down and watch somebody else working on the command line, invariably there are a few times I go, wait, what did you just do? That was cool. I'll need to remember that. So hopefully you'll get at least as many of those in, in this lecture and, and the bit of the next as you do. Ugh, that was awful. He should totally know a better way to do that. Two more thoughts before we dive in. First, as you've already heard me say, and you'll hear me say repeatedly throughout the course, the way to get better at programming is to program. In this case, that applies here too. The way to get better and more comfortable at using the Linux environment is to immerse yourself in that environment and try to do things in that environment, as opposed to working just as hard or harder trying to find ways to avoid doing that. My second thought, and I hope it's a calming one, is that if you play around now, if you experiment now, there's almost nothing you can mess up because you're starting from an almost completely empty account. Any mistakes that would wipe out anything on your account would just be wiping out products of your own experimentation. So the opportunity for learning and developing competence and comfort at effectively no risk is a pretty great bargain. All right, so we have our terminal, terminal emulator here. It's already logged into Arm Lab, and we're ready to run commands in our shell. Now what? The first thing we can do is look at our shell prompt and see that it actually tells us a bit of information right now. It tells us what machine we're on, ArmLab02. Recall that ArmLab is just a front door to two different machines, 01 and 02, and what directory we're in, tilde, which I'll explain in just a second. Note that the shell prompt is highly configurable, though this is the default that we have uh, when, when you configure your account according to how we tell you to do it in precept. And in the lecture notes and the other materials, we'll often just put a dollar sign because by custom, typically shell prompts end with dollar sign or percent sign. The prompt sits here apparently doing nothing, but what it's really doing is just waiting to take the command. So if you enter the command and press return, it will begin the shell's loop of trying to interpret the command. If I just say junk, well, it's a junk command. It isn't a command on the system, so the shell immediately processes it, attempts to run it, and reports back to me with an error that this command doesn't exist. But naturally, we want to focus on commands that do exist, so let's start off with how to get the lay of the land. I mentioned above that the shell already tells us some things. It tells us the machine name, but we know that's not the entire machine name. We can get the entire machine name with the hostname command, which tells us that it is armlab02.cs.princeton.edu. Note that this is case sensitive. If I do hostname, it doesn't tell me anything. This is a Linux thing, not a bash thing. If I come back over here onto 
still bash in my on my MacBook and I do host name that one actually works perfectly well so it is a Linux thing not a bash thing that it's case sensitive but that will be the case for all of the commands that we're going to run and all of the files we're going to create so we've learned how to verify our host name we can figure out who we are with the command who am I but none of this was surprising. I know how I logged in. I know what machine I logged into and what account name I used. The next thing then is, where am I on the file system? The prompt says tilde, but that's weird. That's not entirely meaningful. What you have to realize is that the Linux file system is a tree. It starts at the root, which is a directory that doesn't actually have any name. And then it has a series of subdirectories demarcated with slashes. So you can think of these slashes just as if you were to draw a tree in a data structures course. And so if we do something like this, if we do U C Moretti, we get somewhere. And that in fact is the directory I'm in. Every Linux system, when they set up user accounts, typically gives the each user their own directory. In this case, it's slash U slash the the result of who am I, the login name. Your login name is your net ID. So here I am in the directory slash u slash cmoretti. Oftentimes we don't pronounce the slashes and we'll just say in u cmoretti. But that's not what it said. It said tilde. Well, tilde is just a, a shortcut, an alias for the user's home directory. It's convenient because we often want to interact with our home directory, and so it saves us a little bit of typing to do tilde as opposed to slash u slash your net ID. So that's where we are, and when I did an ls, it actually shows us what's here. ls for list will list the contents of a directory. If you don't give it an argument, it will just list the current directory. But as you saw before, we can give it an argument and it will list the contents of that directory. You can give arguments that are directory names in any of several ways. You can give a full path name. So before I did slash u slash c Moretti. If I was sitting in u or in sitting in c, I could do a, a relative or um, non-absolute directory. So I can do ls u slash c Moretti with no slash because I'm already there. All right, so now you've seen how I can move around as well. CD will move to a directory. Again, you can give it an absolute path or a relative path. You can also do what I just did and do CD with no argument, which will take you back to your home directory. This is a nice natural default case because we often want to do that. One more nicety with CD, we can do CD dash, and that will move us back to whatever our previous directory was. If you ever want to see your directory and you don't want to just trust what the shell prompt says, again, the shell prompt is configurable, also tilde doesn't really tell us a whole lot, we can use the pwd command for print working directory. If I cd back to what I think should be my home directory, it tells me it is, but I can again confirm that with pwd. So in my directory, when I do ls, I see a number of different types of things. The bluish purple things here are directories. These are subdirectories of my home directory. And then there's also um, files that are in just the default text color. If I want to go somewhere else, let's continue with the CD example. If I just type DE here and then hit tab, it will autocomplete to the best of its ability. This isn't perfect, so if, uh, if I cancel that out and do CDS and hit tab, it blinks at me. It says, I, I can't fill that in any farther because you have string proj and survey proj and sim table proj and shell proj. But if I give it enough information, I just type the U, I can now again hit tab and that will give me a full, um, a, a full tab completion and then I can hit enter and go. Another nice thing you can do, if I come back here, imagine that you don't want to go back and remember, wait, what was in that directory that does begin with that? You can hit tab twice and it will print all of the options that are fitting that, that prefix. 
and now I can see which one I want. I thoroughly encourage you to use tab completion, if only because the lab TAs will go nuts if you sit there trying to type out really long path names or really long command names without tab completing. All right, so now we're in survey proj, and when I do an ls here, you'll see that there's actually something slightly different. You can't quite tell from, from my text, but there is actually a green that is different from my text screen for conduct survey. So that green color indicates that it's an executable. Let's see how we can run the executable. One might think that just like the other commands we're doing, like ls and cd, we could just say conduct survey. But when I tab complete it, it doesn't do anything. And indeed, if I try to type it out completely, I think I spelled it right, it still doesn't do anything. The reason here is that the system as we have it set up is configured not to attempt to run things from the current directory unless you explicitly tell it to do so. We'll talk more about this in the more advanced topics in the next lecture, but for now you can just think that I have to give it a relative path starting with the directory it belongs in. So in this case, where? Here. Now we haven't seen this before, but dot is just an alias for here. It just means the current directory that I'm in right now, wherever that might be. So now if I say here, conduct survey, that will work, that tab completed. I also could have given it a absolute path if I actually gave it the correct path, and that would work as well. But again, typing all of that out is much less nice than dot slash conduct survey, and as proof, this actually does work. This is the program for assignment zero. You've seen me do this a few times. Control C, uh, you learned this in 126. Control C will cancel out an execution. Um, this is useful if you have something like an infinite loop, but it's also useful when you just start saying, no, nah, I thought I wanted to run that, but never mind, I don't. All right. So let's go back to the previous directory. How can I do that? I have several options. One, I could use the absolute path. I could do cd slash u slash cmoretti. That's cumbersome. I could do a relative path. Dot's cousin, remember dot is the current directory. Dot's cousin is dot dot, which indicates the parent of this directory. So we could do that, and that would be fine. We've already seen cd dash, that will move us to the previous place we were, which I think was my home directory, but I'm not entirely sure. Again, since the parent of this directory is my home directory, I could do cd tilde or just cd, and all of those would work. There's the one we haven't seen, and again gets back to our home directory. So now that we know some of, something about directories, how do we get them in the first place? All of the commands we've seen thus far are abbreviations, let's say. ls is short for list, and cd is short for change directory. That's a recurring theme. So here we're going to do make directory, but we're going to arbitrarily cut off some letters. So mk for make, dir for directory. Don't ask me, I didn't do it. So make dir, if I just try and do that, it will tell me missing operand, and this is typical. Normally when you do something wrong, it will print out some information about how to use that command. In this case, it tells me there's a missing operand, but it doesn't really tell me what it should be. What it does do, as many uh, programs will, many uh, standard commands, will have a minus minus help command line option that you can give that will give more information. If we do that, the standard here is that the usage will have all caps things are the arguments, and with hopefully some meaningful name, and things in brackets are arguments that are optional. So in this case, makedir takes various options, and the thing that it absolutely has to have is a directory. We could have learned more about this with not just the help page, but there's actually for almost any given command and also many library functions, we have the manual pages. I mentioned this slightly in the uh, first part of this lecture. We can do man, and in this case, makedir. And this gives you 
a little bit more verbose description. The man page interface is a bit clunky. Um, you use return or enter to go one line at a time and spacebar to go a screen at a time. It does tell you how to use it. You can use H and then to get out of here you do Q for quit. So we learned a little bit about this. We learned that we can make dir and just give um, a directory name. So let's do it. Make dir a, everything looks good. Make dir x, y, z, no complaints. Hopefully those actually exist. And indeed we see that we have a and x, y, z that were created right about now. So we can do each of those separately what we can also do is make a directory hierarchy all at once. So I can do make dir bc. But it doesn't actually work quite yet because b doesn't exist. I could do make dir b and then make dir bc, but make dir actually provides a minus p option to make all of the parents in the in the hierarchy. So make dir bc will do it. We have ls, we now have a b, ls b, we have a c. So that's all about make dir. If we tried to, the one last thing is if we tried to make a directory that already exists, it won't let us, it will fail with a meaningful error message that says we can't do it because it already exists. All right. So now we've created a whole bunch of useless directories. Let me clean them up. I can do so with the rmdir command. Again, we're going to have random letters there and not, but rm for remove, dir for directory. So rm dir, I can do a bunch at once, but not all of them because b is not empty. So rm dir will only let you remove an empty directory. This is for your own benefit. So you don't remove something and go, oh, I just deleted everything in the world. So here it won't let you. Um, we have a number of different ways we could do this. We could remove um, B slash C, we could remove using the same uh, command, min the same option minus P that we did for make dir, we can do remove B uh, slash C, that would also work. So now if I do an LS, I have proof that all of those directories went away. All right, so let's get one new directory again and we'll talk about files. Note that when I make a directory, it doesn't actually go there. It just makes it and leaves the location the same as it was. So make dirs are very often followed by CDs. One of the most common um, shortcuts I've seen in people's advanced configurations is actually to have a new command for make dir that's a make dir and follow that some short keyboard sequence to say, make a directory and then go there. All right, so we went to, to, to file test and we need some files. Um, I know of one file that we saw in the previous directory, so let's use it. We will use cp to copy. Again, with the, these are the right letters, but not all of them. We can give the path using the tilde for variety. And we will copy it to dot. What does dot mean? Dot, remember, is this current directory. If we give it a directory name, it will keep the same file name as it already has. If we give it a file name, it will give that file name. So now we have a bash rc and a bash rc2. I forgot the dot in the second one. It doesn't actually matter in the sense that, unlike in some operating systems, file names are pretty arbitrary. You'll notice that we're not dealing with things that have um, suffixes. None of these is dot text. Um, I have or don't have a dot at the beginning of it doesn't matter. We can name things almost whatever we want. All right. Um, so we saw ls before, but now that we know about man pages, we can do a little bit more with, with ls. So if we do man ls, you'll see that there are a lot of options. I mean, a lot, a lot of options. So many options. So many options. Let's use ls minus l. That's the most common useful one. And that gives us a long listing of what's here. So here there's some confusing stuff. We've got dot and dot dot that's been appearing and now we see information about them. So we're, we're listing our directories. We also have the two files. 
Over on the left, we have permissions. These are permissions for the files. Um, they look cryptic. We'll talk about them in another uh, another session. But basically, it's the uh, the second, third, and fourth digits there are the read, write, and execute permissions for me as the owner of the file. A read means I have permission to open the file. A write means I have permission to, to edit the file. And execute means I have the ability to call it as a command. In this case, these are just text files, so I can read them, I can write them, but execute wouldn't do much. All right, uh, you'll also notice that the directories have slightly different permissions. Um, they are Byzantine, and I will, again, we'll talk about them in a different, a different lesson, but I will also leave them to you to learn about by doing man page on the chmod command. chmod changes the permissions in a file, or as they call them, the file mode bits. The other information about the, um, the files we have in addition to the permissions, some stuff about how it is stored in the file system, the owner of it, you can see my username seem already there, the size of the file, in this case uh, 1988 is the number of bytes in the file, and the modification time. This is the last time it was updated. So now we can look at several file commands. The first is cat, which is short for concatenate, which means append that file to something else. By default, the terminal. Add it at the end. So bash rc2, it prints out the entirety of it. That's useful in lots of cases, but it's not so useful for viewing it because then I'm requiring to scroll up a whole bunch and that's just not the best way. A way to see it progressively is more, which perhaps you saw in 126. Here we can do more. It shows us one screen. We can again hit enter a few times and go one at a time, or we can do the space bar to go a screen at a time. You don't have to understand what any of this says. Bash RC is actually a configuration file that is a bunch of bash commands that gets run when you begin your shell. So it's basically if when you start your shell, you always want to do something, you can have it done automatically. In this case, it's a whole bunch of setup. Getting a bash RC is one of the pieces of the setup that we'll ask you to do with configuring your environment in Precept 1. So along with more, more isn't that great because if I do this again and now I say, oh, I went too far, I want to back up and it doesn't let me. So as a terrible pun, less is a command that is more than more because it can do more things if you use it right less dot bash rc you will see that you can go down just like before and you can also go back up which is perhaps useful the weird pagination over there on the left is just that i have a comment that is wider than my terminal and so it wraps around this is why when every style guide you ever see says, don't make your lines too long, this is why. Uh, as an aside, those line numbers are something that's actually set up in my bash RC. That won't come in the default configuration, but less is still more than more in that you can move up and down. Other commands to see what's in the file, you might want to look at only the top or only the bottom of the file. First, let's do clear. Clear just says, I'm getting frazzled by how many things are on my terminal right now. Move them all up and give me a fresh screen. So I can do just the first bunch of lines. I can control how many of those there are with head minus n and some number. And the, the opposite of head is tail, so I can again do tail minus n5 dot bash rc. Um, and it will give me the last five lines. So head gives you the first n lines, tail gives you the last n lines. Another thing we might want to know is how big a file is. We saw that we can give some options to ls and get this, but another tool that you'll find useful is wc, which prints out the number of lines, number of words, and number of characters. You might ask, why wc? Well, it was it's an extension of the old word count program, which tells you how many words. It just, in this case, tells you a whole bunch more than that. 
In this case, word just means a series of non-white space characters delimited by white space. It's not actual English language words or anything like that. So we can do WC. And we see again that 1988 is the number of bytes. It apparently has 66 lines and 249 words. One gotcha with several of these commands, like cat and wc and less, like you already saw me make the mistake, is that if not given any arguments, they compute on standard input. So if you just say wc minus l to give it uh, the word count, show me only the number of lines, it will appear like it's hanging. Looks like it's not doing anything. Not doing anything. But it's not. It's actually waiting for input. And so if we say, I'm done with input, never mind, it will actually tell me that I wrote three lines. You might recall from, from 126 that uh, control D will say, I'm done with input. Send it EOF, so to speak. So you might ask, why would they do this? Why would they have this, this uh, hang up that seems to be naturally confusing? And one common workflow in Linux is to use pipelines. You learned about this in 126. I know it uh, comes up on exam one frequently, and you had, had to use it in the atomic assignment. If we want to run a command and then see statistics about the output, we can run the command and then pipe the result into WC. So consider, for example, if instead of, want, instead of wanting to know how many characters there were in the entire file, we only cared about the first line. That's how we get the first line, that head command that gives it the minus n to say how many. Bash rc, and we pipe that into, let's see, all of them. It indeed has one line. Weirdly enough, it has one word, and it has 73 characters. Why does it have one line? Well, if we cat dot bash rc, you will recall that that doesn't do anything because it shows us all of it. If we do head minus n1 dot bash rc, you'll recall that it has a comment at the top that is just this one big long line of dashes. So there is only one word in the entirety of the line. All right, so while we're on the topic, other redirections in addition to pipelines are super useful. You learned about them in 126. Um, so if I wanted to copy a file, we saw I could do a CP. I can also cat the file and then redirect the output. Cat writes on the standard output, so redirecting the output to bash rc3, and that works great. You'll see that it has exactly the same contents. Um, it is newer. So we can do that. Um, we, uh, I, I will note here that... Um, more realistically, that would just be copy, would be using it with something like head or tail. So if we only wanted a portion of the file, we could do head minus one dot bash rc, output to header line. And now we have header line that's only those 73 characters on the first line. So just now we saw one way to create a new file, by redirecting output from a command. There are numerous other ways. If we want to create an empty file, we can do touch. Touch will create an empty file. Touch is actually, that's a, a side benefit of it. Touch's real purpose is to update a file to be uh, its modification time mo more recent. So if I touch bash rc2 and I check, it is now 10 minutes newer than it was before. So that's what touch really does, but it has this nice benefit of if you touch a file that doesn't exist, it creates it. We just saw output redirection. We can actually output redirect the null command. So this says run no command and then output its standard output to this file. Well, no command has no standard output, so that works great. Uh, the null command is actually a thing um, as, as a bash syntax token, but it doesn't do anything. It's just there for purposes like this. One thing to note, um, many of the commands we've seen thus far, copy, move, um, overwrite, are cautious. The way that we have it set up is that it won't clobber. It won't overwrite without asking you. So in the case of copy, if I try to copy header line to header line two, it will ask, do you want to overwrite this? And I can say yes or no. 
Similarly, if I want to move, I can move header line to header line three. It will ask, do you want to do this? Yes. Um, the overwriting is similar. If I cat bash rc2 to header line two, it will tell me you can't do it. There's a way around this though, because it's not prompting you, it's just saying you can't. If I overwrite and put a bar that says, no, really, I want to overwrite it, and so that will actually do it. And as proof, header line two now has 1988, not 73. Finally, of course, we could use a um, text editor to create a file, and that's probably the most common, but I will leave Emacs and other text editing goodness to precept. So we've seen copy. I just, saw, I just showed you move, which says move a file from one location to another. This is also good for renaming it. The last thing to talk about is we saw remove dir, rmdir. We can remove a file with just rm, rm.bashrc. It again is cautious. It will ask you, are you sure you want to do this? That's the basics of how to move around directories, how to work with files in simple manner. There's lots more to Linux. I encourage you to play around with it. Take the precept handout, play with all the things, see what you can find out. And next time uh, for Thursday's lecture, I will give just a little bit more about how to configure Bash to do some cool things and how to get an environment that feels a little bit more, more robust.